fantastic pleasure meeting you all at least virtually I see some names some cartoons and a few people uh, okay. now I see one more person so I think uh, it's starting to get better um, but uh, pleasure meeting you and uh, it's great that we can meet in these slightly weird circumstances but what we learned in our office uh, these circumstances also have unexpected efficiencies it would be completely impossible for me to visit you physically in Moscow so doing like this uh, doing the lectures like this is actually for me a pleasure uh, Katya organized this. Katya was one of my students at the Strelka and HSC course um, three years ago by now. And I'm super happy that uh, she went on to bigger and greater things and at the same time kept in touch so we can now uh, do this together. Uh, I will share my screen now to start the lecture. Uh, if you are all right with that, um, let me check whether this works. I think you should now see my screen. Um, I call this lecture series Deep Urbanism, a working hypothesis, and this lecture one is the first of seven and it will serve as an introduction. The lecture series is something I have been developing over the last 10 years and tried for the first time to tell in a consolidated way uh, to the Strelka students three years ago. And what you now will hear is a more consolidated version uh, of the same thinking. Uh, we are Hosoya Schaefer Architects. You see our website. My name is Marcus Schaefer. You have below my email. And I will be assisted by Damien Kokalewski, a uh, person with a PhD from the ETH, who will help me a bit uh, with the lectures and might also, in the course uh, of these lecture series, help you with answering questions and so on. Uh, after this slightly hurried introduction, we will also post a uh, more uh, refined curriculum so that you have a bit of a better overview over the entire lecture series. And in the end, the question is extremely simple, which we will try to answer together. Um, but you will see that the answer to this simple question is a complex one. And the question comes from Jane Jacobs book, Death and Life of Great American Cities, which she published in 1961. And is basically the kind of problem a city is. So what is a city actually? This question sounds trivial because we all live in cities. We work on cities professionally. And we have a fairly consistent narrative of what we believe a city is. But as in philosophy, the more closely we look at this question, what actually is a city, the more complex, the more multifaceted, and the deeper the answer to this question will become. And this journey asking the question is the journey I want to take you on these seven lectures. And we will do this in the form of a working hypothesis. This term is for me quite important because I believe that as architects we have the opportunity, the pleasure and probably also the needs to jump back and forth between different level of explanations. The level of sciences, where we deal with facts, we, we deal with realities, and we have an explanatory model um, which follows the scientific method in that it is falsifiable, 
it is shared among many people, it is coherent, and you can go from one point of insight to the next one, so from the form of a water molecule to the reason why ice floats, to the color of the fur of a polar bear, um, and so on. So that's the, the body of thought which is science. But we also have to deal with the idiothetic um, explanatory models of, of the humanities, so the soft sciences, which deal with theories, so social studies, history, and so on. And also these theories are compatible with each other, in parts at least. But on the other hand, of course, they also tend to be organized in bodies of work, where you follow a particular sociologist or historian and so on, and you need to understand a particular way of looking at the world when you deal uh, with the humanities. And finally, of course, as designers, we also do our own design research, which has to do with developing our own specific narratives. Some of these narratives can be shared. Other narratives are actually made to be specific because it anchors us in an academic or in a professional or even a commercial marketplace. So some of these narratives are uh, meant to be shared and understood by everybody. Some of these narratives by some designers are also made to actually hide the way uh, you work, to make your work more interesting, but also a bit more complex so that you don't easily understand what the person is talking about, but it sounds super interesting. And then finally, we of course have design praxis, which is all about applications. So again, when we work on our working hypothesis together, we will oscillate back and forth between facts, theories, narratives, some genuine, some rather obfuscating, and between applied uh, work in the later lectures. And it is important, I believe, that we label what we are talking about, that we label whether we talk about facts or we label which theory we use to understand something or we label the personal interest in a design research narrative so that we always have a clean discussion and we don't uh, lose ourselves uh, in false facts or obfuscating narratives. So this intellectual clarity is extremely important for me. That's one reason why I'm interested in this working hypothesis. The other reason why I'm, work, I'm interested in a working hypothesis is that it needs to be good enough to support everyday decision making in a professional practice. We don't need perfection. We need to, be a, we need to enable ourselves to make good decisions in daily life. It should also be robust and adaptable enough to serve as a platform for exchange with more knowledgeable, knowledgeable people of many different disciplines. It's impossible for an architect and urbanist to know everything, but we need to find a way of thinking and a way of working and arguing which is compatible with other people so that together we can um, generate systems of thinking and ideas for problem solving um, which function. And then finally, of course, I also believe that this working hypothesis should be falsifiable and adaptable, as in science. It should be integrative and extendable, um, as in the humanities, and it should be applicable and useful as it, is ha as it has to serve uh, for our daily work as designers. So we'll have seven lectures at 60 minutes followed by a 30 minutes discussion and after the lecture series uh, Katya and I are thinking that it would be great that you would produce a mental map of the content of the lectures so a kind of a sketch or a diagram or a drawing which allows you to organize the information I have given to you in a way that it works for you that you can record it, you can organize it, and you can make accessible what you learned. Right? It's basically a kind of an easy way of summarizing uh, what you have seen 
in these seven lectures so that you can keep it for the rest of your professional life. These are the lecture times. Katja will tell you uh, when it actually will happen. This is the first one. And this brings us to the start, uh, to a flight um, over the globe, a completely urbanized globe. This is a view from the ISS space station. It's a view which in 1965 Yuri Gagarin, as the first man in space, had for the very first time. But he, when orbiting around the globe, was looking down on a planet of 3.5 billion people. Today we have passed 7 billion, even 8 billion, and the UN projection is that we will live in 2050 on a planet of around 10 billion people. This is a gigantic change in less than a lifetime. And when we look at this change in the context um, of a longer period of growth, then you could explain what's happening with this diagram. This is basically the explosion of the human population over the last 10,000 years, starting with the agricultural revolution around 8,000 before Christ. In red, you have the population increase, super exponentially scaling upwards, specifically in the last decades. In blue, you have the big historic periods, so the New Stone Age, Bronze Age, Iron Age, the Middle Ages and the Modern Age we are in currently. You have the Agricultural Revolution 8000 before Christ and the Industrial Revolution at around uh, 1750. And below these little dots are people. The small ones are biological generations. So 25 year intervals, me and my son. The big people are oral history intervals, 75 years apart. So a gra great grandfather and his great grandson passing on verbally the history of a culture this great grandson has been born into or great granddaughter has been born into. And the amazing thing is that with only 30 of these oral history generations, we already reach the birth of Christ. We are living in an explosion of change, which both culturally and biologically has been unprecedented. The change we are witnessing uh, is fast already for our own lives, but looked at in terms of cultural change and evolutionary change, it is happening at lightning speed. And this means we have very little um, knowledge, uh, both at the dynamics and the consequences of this rapid change we are living in. When we now pivot, so to speak, and don't look at time, but look at space, something similar is happening. It is as if globalization is undoing continental drift and is pulling our urban culture closer together. What you're seeing here is an image of our urbanized planet. You have big squares. The bigger the square, the more people live in this particular city and its urban agglomeration. For example, on the left, you see Mexico City with its about 30, almost 30 million people. And the redder, uh, the more red a city is, the more globalized it is, based on data by Peter J. Taylor, 
measuring global consulting practices and their branch offices uh, in particular cities. So you see a kind of a global downtown around the um, Western industrialized nations. You see um, in the East, the Asian countries, of course, changing very rapidly, Beijing already surpassing the US in terms of economic size uh, very soon. And you see also, of course, India, in India, for example, and southern um, South America, um, other large population centers which are moving very rapidly towards a more globalized state. But of course, what is also happening is that not, not all of this urbanization is good and solid. At the same time, while our cities are urbanizing in a kind of a controlled way, you have also an uncontrolled urbanization. You have basically urbanization without the production of urban infrastructure or um, more uh, in everyday language, uh, the generation of slums. Um, so you have, for some reason, a gigantic explosion of urban fabric and urban connections. On the one hand, in an organized way, uh, in the uh, developed countries, and in a not so organized way, in the emerging countries. So something is happening not only in time, something is happening also in space. And we see it whenever we leave our doors and enter the city which we happen to live in. Now, again, cities are our everyday reality, so it's very hard to understand what's going on and it's hard to understand where these dynamics are actually coming from. Whenever you're confronted with something complex and changing, it is a good idea to follow this phenomenon backwards in time and try to find out where it actually started from. And this is what we are going to do. We are going to look at this urbanized planet I tried to explain you now, and we are turning back the clock. We are traveling back in time, looking always at the 10 largest cities of a particular age, and we see where this um, travel in time will lead us. These are the 10 largest cities today. We see an equal spread on all continents uh, with the very large uh, urban centers uh, in the Americas, in Asia, and in Africa with Cairo. This is data from um, Chandler, 5,000 years of urban history, uh, where he accumulated, uh, assembled uh, all of this data in a coherent manner. If we now jump backwards to 1950s, then you see, for example, that in the US, uh, the West Coast is not yet part of the large urban centers. You see that Europe is still more important than it is today, with London and Paris being very visible. You also see Moscow being visible. In Asia, you see Tokyo and Shanghai. If you go back to the 1900s, you see the core of industrialization with Manchester, London, Paris, Berlin, and of course, St. Petersburg, Tokyo, the end of the Meiji Empire. And you see um, the industrial centers uh, in the US. Around 1800, again, you see the beginning of industrialization in Europe and you see the end um, of the temporary end uh, of the Chinese empire before it became colonialized. Um, and you see Tokyo and Kyoto um, still defending themselves against the colonialists. In 1500, so the Middle Ages, you see how uh, the, the focus of the world was very much in the Middle East and specifically also uh, in China. Around 1000, you see Kyoto and Kaifeng, and you see the importance uh, of the Middle East. Then 100 AD, of course, you see Rome and Carthago in 
before Christ, you see Rome, Athens, Alexandria. And then you start to see how we reach this start of urbanization um, in the Mesopotamian countries, specifically 3000 before Christ with cities like Ur, Uruk, Akkad, Thebes. Um, and if we then go to this very core uh, of uh, this kind of urbanization of the planet, the very origin, then we, we can, for example, take the city-state of Ur as an example of how the idea of cities uh, developed. This is an illustration of the city-state of Ur. You see the canals which have been diverted from the river Euphrat, um, bringing water to the fields around this city-state. You have to imagine that around this city wall there was a four kilometer radius ring of fertile land irrigated and domesticated from the arid lands uh, of this site between the river Euphrat and Tigris in uh, Mesopotamia. Inside the city wall you see a highly differentiated culture with buildings and roads and you see in the very middle the temple. These early Mesopotamian or more specifically Sumerian cities were very much organized around the temple. The temple was legitimation, so it was the core narrative of the city. It was the organizational core also, so you went to the temple to get a job. And the temple also was a center for redistribution. It was the place where the agricultural society of the city was organized from. So the priests were important. The kings, which uh, started to become more and more important from the Sumerian towards the, the Assyrian cities, the kings were actually more like um, CEOs. So they, they organized and ran the cities, but they were not so important in terms of the city's main narrative. The temple, the temples were the core. And you have to imagine when you were standing on these temple mounds and you were looking into the distance, you looked over the city walls, the canals, this fertile agricultural ring, and in the haze uh, towards the horizon, you were seeing again the temple mounds of the next city-state in this polycentric urban network of early Mesopotamia. And however, if you imagine this city, then already you have to ask again, well, this cannot be the beginning because this Sumerian cities were already quite complex. Already a lot of knowledge had to be had. Good narratives had to be um, told. Infrastructures and institutions had to be present in order to stabilize a complex city system, uh, even in these very, very early times when the city of Ur still had a kind of um, an almost diagrammatic clarity of city, city wall, agricultural ring, and these types of city-states being linked together in the polycentric system um, of Mesopotamia. So something had already had to happen earlier. So if we now take our movie going backward in time and travel even earlier to earlier times, to around 10,000 before present time, then we come to something like this. This is a reconstruction uh, of the Göbekli Tepe temple, an archaeological site. Uh, it's a site where we find these round structures. Inside these round structures we have um, these large uh, 
Stelen, uh, where we have images of boars and antelopes um, which were shown and we have to imagine that at this time 10,000 years before today putting these types of stones and infrastructures together was an unbelievable effort of energy and cooperation. It was not simple to do this. It was actually a crazy endeavor when you think about it. Why would people spend so much energy, time and effort together to produce this? The hypothesis could be that the people of that time living in what we call today the Fertile Crescent in southern Anatolia, in today's Turkey, that they started to realize the ecological pressures um, in the landscape they were inhabiting as the early hunter-gatherers. They were realizing that all of a sudden antelopes were not quite so abundant anymore. That it was harder to hunt for boars. And for sure the megafauna, so the giant mammals uh, which were feeding our species at the end of the Ice Age, like mammoths and so on, we know, all know the stories. All of these giant mammals were slaughtered and had disappeared. And with this feeling of ecological pressure, maybe the people started to band together and started to find stories which allowed them to explain the past and enabled them to think about the future together. And while they had these structures they built, they also needed to stay there and take care of these structures. So settlements became important and possible because they needed to um, organize life around this temple. And it has been hypothesized that at this moment they also started to ferment grasses, grass seeds, into the very first beer, the very first uh, alcohol. And we have to imagine that these people were living around these temple structures, drinking the first beer, slaughtering the first domesticated animals, thinking about the past and envisioning the future, telling each other the stories and having the kinds of rights which stabilized this group of people in space and time and slowly developing in the course of that, step by step, the, the tools and knowledge which allowed then bigger urban structures to emerge. So what you see here is a map of the domestication of wheat uh, in this half moon, so again the Fertile Crescent, um, in grey, where you see in the white rect uh, right triangles you see uh, grasses which are still wild, so they have large grains and grains which are um, dispersed by the wind. So you have a wild rachis. Rachis is the top uh, of a grass and normally grasses are um, dispersed uh, by the wind. So the seeds are dispersed uh, by the wind. And of course, um, this is uh, kind of inefficient because when you grab these grasses with your hand and you try to get the seeds into a pot in order to make beer, then you lose a lot uh, of these seeds. However, if you happen to grab a grass where the seeds are a bit more solid, a bit better attached to the top of this grass, then it's more likely that the seed ends up in your pot. And if you grab these grasses for hundreds of years, then you are basically evolving the grass towards a more stable um, um, affixation of the seeds 
to the top of the grass or to a more stable rachis, and you turn a grass which was formerly uh, dispersed by the wind to a grass which has to be dispersed by mankind because the rack is, so the top of the grass, is very solid. So you have to imagine that over hundreds of years of hands grabbing grasses, we slowly domesticated uh, the grass into what we now know as barley, wheat and other things. So a formerly wild species, the grass, became domesticated and entangled with us, our species, mankind. And what then happened is that this knowledge which has been gathered in Göbekli Tepe, so you see that um, with this hammer-like um, um, thing there in the, in the middle of the image. So this, these abilities which have been developing there over hundreds of years, uh, so domesticated wheat, domesticated animals, rituals and narratives and the ability to build settlements has been taken and when the people moved down along this green arrow to um, the um, two river land, so Tigris and Euphrat, Mesopotamia, they took with them this knowledge, a knowledge which enabled them to build more complex, more resource intense um, societies. And of course, they took with them also the memories of this time in Göbekli Tepe, the memories of a time, of course, now ritualized religious memories, where they then told the stories uh, of the gods which gave them the wheat and of the first couple, Adam and Eve, uh, which basically lived in paradise, lost paradise, and was then starting agriculture and, of course, also an urban culture. From Uruk and Ur, bottom right, um, then uh, people started traveling also towards the east again, uh, most notably Abraham, who was born in Ur and went to what is today's uh, Israel. And Abraham, of course, took with him some of the stories, uh, specifically also the story of Adam and Eve and paradise. And started then a kind of an urban culture which started to settle the Mediterranean coast. So my argument is that urbanization started in this very early moment uh, when ritual sites allowed us to settle and around these settlements the tools and the narratives the infrastructures and institutions of a potentially urban culture started to develop. And what we have then been doing over time is we took these early tools and early narratives, we turned them into more powerful tools and narratives, for example, during industrialization, and even more powerful tools and narratives during digitalization. But it's always the same thing. It's narratives and technologies for people to interact, to share stories, to inhabit spaces which stabilize us in space and time in a way where we then become able to have a surplus um, to share work and divide work and to socially differentiate and to become the complex societies which we are today. So if you abstract this a bit, and this is what I call the urban ax axioms, so the kind of the ground truths of urbanity, then you could argue that cities are places where we interact, so we share information like we do now through this strangely urban infrastructure called Zoom, Cities are also places where we transact, where we share materials and goods, um, for example, 
you now sitting in your rooms, drinking water, eating bread. And all of this is organized by relations. And again, these relations are technologically enabled. So you could argue that the interactions allow us to socially differentiate and generate a culture. Transactions allow us to divide work, generate markets and economy. And relations allow us to lift our connectedness to have the kinds of infrastructures and institutions which allow us to stabilize these um, relations in space and time so that in the end we are able to have complex civilizations very much revolving around urbanity. Or even more simplified, you could argue that it is all about information innovation in terms of interaction. Either it is around production and added value in terms of transaction. And most importantly, it is about trust in terms of relations. Now let me explain this quickly. I believe that everything that counts in the end is connectedness, is the ability to have relationships. And if these relationships are stable in space and time, you can count on them. You all know that in your family, uh, in your friends' relationships. Uh, and the same is true also for cities. If you're sure that the metro, the subway works, if you're sure that when you turn uh, your faucet that water comes out, if you're sure that when you switch on your computer that this Zoom conference actually will work, then you can count on the connectedness of a highly technological civilization which emerged over the last centuries or as I would argue, over the last 10,000 years. Now, counting on relationships also means you can trust them. And trust means you believe in the permanence of the relationships in the future. If you trust in the, the permanence of social relations, then you have social capital. If you trust in the permanence of kind of um, um, ideas, then you have cultural capital. If you trust in the permanence of resource flow, then you have infrastructural or industrial capital. And if you trust in the permanence of um, uh, value relationships, then you have financial capital, right? So capital, in the end, is nothing else than formalized trust. So if you look at this little piece of paper um, with a number on it and the signature uh, of the National Bank's president on it, then this simply means that we as a society trust in the permanence of the relationships of a particular urbanized nation state. Right. But of course, we all know that um, this trust is something which is a convention. Right. It's also possible that we don't trust anymore uh, in the permanence of relationships. So we as soon as we understand that um, that uh, relationships are something which has a dynamic, can change in time, we can choose to trust or also not trust. So it's not a given that um, a particular connectedness uh, remains intact. But of course, it is very important for us that we can trust it. Now, of course, the more a system grows, the more power it has. And growth, therefore, uh, is something which is inherently interesting uh, for an urban system. And in the past, we grew in various different ways. We grew, of course, by having increasingly material capabilities. So ships, 
or the invention of the wheel. Uh, and then, of course, with industrialization at the bottom right, uh, the invention of increasingly powerful infrastructures and machinery, which allowed us to increasingly eff effectively work with matter, produce goods and conquer space. So connectedness scaled up very rapidly in the last 300 years due to uh, industrialization. But still, uh, you know, this is um, not the fastest way possible we can work on connectedness because we can also basically leave the realm of the material. We can virtualize relationships, for example, by turning something real, something tangible into information. So, for example, we turn value, lift value, um, uh, like um, bread I can eat or a friend at my side, I can turn that into abstract value. We have seen uh, the issue of money. If I believe in the permanence of this relationship, I can turn this into something virtual. So I can turn value into coins. I can turn coins into paper money. I can tur turn paper money into electronic money and into digital banking. The same is true for anything. I can virtualize anything real or almost anything real and um, turn it into a much easier to transport inf in information. And of course, the final version of that is what we call today digitalization, which I will talk about more in the future lectures. And this speeding up of the material world through industrialization and the speeding up of the information flows through virtualization and specifically now digitalization allowed us, of course, to scale, to scale our urban system to a truly planetary urbanization or what we call commonly globalization. And the question now, of course, is this global state we are living in, is that stable or are there also other dynamics which we need to understand? This sounds all extremely abstract, but let me give you a couple of examples. So basically we have seen that cities are places in which people interact and transact. So in the middle here you see a city as a big blob which protects exchange, a marketplace. For example, the city of Ur, where people bring their agricultural goods and trade them for other goods and services. And the city therefore starts to control resource flows going into the city and people going into the city, and it also starts controlling services and goods which are leaving the city. And if you now imagine one of these first cities doing this, then of course larger resource flows or trade routes start to develop where the city starts getting things which are not produced locally, for example, obsidian or precious, other precious minerals. Um, and then it starts, of course, to make sense that along these trade routes, peripheral cities, trading posts, maybe at first start to develop. These trading posts then start to realize that they can add value already before they deliver the goods uh, into the city, which makes them um, more competitive in terms of their own economy. That then over time starts to become increasingly successful, um, a, a process which Jane Jacobs called import replacement where increasingly the peripheral city started to learn how to add value before they send the goods to the core city. And adding value also means that increasingly they have their own urban value chains in the peripheral city. They start, they learn what it means to be a town and learn what it means to be a city, become increasingly more urban themselves and over time are urban enough that when the core city at some point disappears, um, for example, um, you know, the Mesopotamian city um, crashing down and then other cities taking over, then they can take the place of the former core city and become more and more important themselves. 
So, for example, after the Mesopotamian cities, we have cities like Knossos in Crete, which also were large agricultural um, organizations, which I will talk about in the next lecture in a bit more detail. And Knossos on Crete, um, in order to trade and in order to defend itself, had a very powerful fleet of ships. This fleet, however, had to be built with trees and soon the island of Crete did not have enough trees anymore and the Minoans had to go north um, over the Mediterranean Ocean to import timber from another place uh, uh, called Mycenae at that moment a tiny little village probably simply um, able to export timber to this very powerful um, uh, place um, of the Minoan Empire. But when then the Minoan Empire collapsed very much probably due to ecological reasons, Mycenae took over, became again the core city of its age before it then again was swept away by the Dorians which started to um, build then the city-states of Athens and others. Athens then was superseded by Carthage. That then was superseded by Rome. Rome then collapsed, was superseded by London and Paris before then the US became dominant, etc., etc., etc. So through this process of urban growth, extending trade routes and resource flows, exporting urban value chains and narratives and through import replacement the cities becoming more intelligent and urban themselves that generated a kind of an urban relay run which went all the way from Mesopotamia to what we now know uh, as our cities you know via um, places like Rome which blossomed and collapsed and when, while it blossomed, generated very well-organized colonial outposts, like, for example, here the Roman colony of Timgat, which was basically a place, a, a place of bureaucracy, which allowed Rome to control the breadbasket in North Africa, feeding, of course, mainly the central city, Rome itself. We had then the colonial empires, uh, the English, German or the French empires and others which organized the entire world into their uh, urban resource flows in, with London of course, uh, with uh, the English of course uh, feeding specifically London as the main capital of that empire. We have the Cold War with the two uh, systems opposed to each other and then finally the multipolar global city system which we have today. So a kind of an an, an urban relay which started in Mesopotamia, spread around the globe and now is touching everywhere, everywhere, generating peaks of urbanity and landscapes of devastation. And gigantic trade routes of transactions of matter and interactions here uh, with the internet being active over the course of a day, uh, also with flows of information. All of this, of course, happening on this blue planet, traveling around the sun, which is, of course, a system with limits. So this, to show you the point we are at right now, we started going back in time. We visited the very, very first instances of cities. We looked at what actually makes cities tick and function and spread and become more powerful and share information. We saw how cities stabilize us as a civilization in space and time through infrastructures and institutions through stories and spaces. And we see now how 
rapidly in the last hundreds of years or even decades or even years these urban systems started to span the globe and of course what we now know since the Apollo missions is how nevertheless despite of this great acceleration which we witnessed we still are facing a limited system and this Planetary boundaries become painfully visible. This is work by Rockström et al. Uh, of the Resilience Alliance, where we see we have problems in biodiversity, losing too much of it too quickly. We have problems in the nitrogen cycle, uh, producing too much nitrogen with the Harbour Bosch um, um, process than uh, our planet can absorb. We have a problem of climate change, problem of ocean acidification and so on and so on. So the green circle in the middle is a planet which is still somewhat sustainable and the red of course shows us how much we overshoot in terms of the urban system which we have created and of course are all part of. And what we also know from history is that societies, and specifically cities, are not stable per se. Cities are not inherently sustainable. Cities boom and bust, like the early Metro, uh, Mesopotamian cities we have seen. And Jared Diamond, an, an anthropologist, looking at ancient civilizations, showed us very clearly what the reasons are why these ancient civilizations chose to fail or to survive. And this tree trunk, of course, shows you that all of the urban history which we witness is still younger than some of the trees currently living on Earth. Right? So a single individual of one species has a lifespan which is longer than all of our vanity which we're currently witnessing. And he said, or he um, uh, summarized that collapses in the past, so which we witness in the archae archaeological and sometimes even the historic record, they collapsed due to ecological degradation, to climate change, hostile neighbors, decreasing support by friendly neighbors, or also due to the change of societies. With climate change, in his case, he meant local climate change. For example, again, what we have seen in Crete with the Minoan Empire collapsing because they, um, um, they felled all of the timber on their island and lost the um, uh, climate protection of a, a tree cover. And, of course, in our case, uh, today, climate change is a much more global phenomenon. And based on this slightly precarious situation we are in, I believe we need to do two things. Uh, with well, Immanuel Wallerstein, we need to be able to understand ourselves as a system in order to understand the dynamics we are in better. And together with Bernard Brodel, we need to understand the long-term changes and the long-term dynamics um, of our civilizations or what he called the long durée, so the long duration um, of um, civilizations, in order to better understand the situation we are in. And in the second half of the lecture I will give you a couple of insights into that, because since a while this understanding of systems on a kind of a planetary scale actually started to develop first in science with people like Alexander von Humboldt um, and with his book series called Cosmos, trying to assemble all of this knowledge in a coherent way, understanding that everything is linked, everything is related uh, in nature and in extrapolation, of course, also everything is related uh, for us human beings. We have Ernst Haeckel, 
who coined the term uh, ecology, um, which has to do with a kind of an economy of nature, again showing that everything is related. We have the Russian philosopher Vladimir Vernatsky um, talking about the biosphere expanding of concepts by the geographer Eduard Suess. We have, of course, Buckminster Fuller with his idea of the operating manual for spaceship Earth or James Lovelock with the concept of Gaia. Always with the idea that um, we need to understand this planet we are on or to talk with Fuller, this spaceship we are traveling with, better um, because we now are truly affecting it as a species in a global scale. Um, <clears throat> issues of sustainability, of course, um, play into that, um, which were formalized first on a global scale with the Brundtland Commission, Commission in 1987, where we talk about the needs on the one hand of people, uh, of everybody, on the other hand, of course, also the limitations put upon us uh, by the limits of our planet and by ecology. The points of commons is very important, um, of course, both with the tragedy of the commons, where Hardin in 1968 showed that because we do not understand the relatedness of things, we tend to pollute and abuse in ways the plentitude of what, ha has na what nature has given us because we don't understand the scale of the effect uh, we have uh, on the planet. And then Ostrom, Elinor Ostrom, Nobel Prize winner, with her book in 1990, trying to clarify what we need in order to better uh, steward this spaceship Earth or the planet which we are on. Um, with her eight points. So, you know, understanding boundaries, uh, making sure that rules and local conditions are coinciding, uh, make sure that the choices are collective and inclusive. We need to monitor, we need to resolve conflicts, and we need to nest things uh, together from the small to the medium sized to the bigger in order to govern uh, this um, system we are in better. And there are three different ways of looking at this. One is systems engineering, where people like J. Wright Forrester uh, showed us uh, a kind of a technical approach to um, understanding complex systems, um, where he showed that um, there are strange relationships uh, in systems between um, uh, which are working together where I need to be a bit quicker now otherwise I will bore you um, where um, in a very technical way he tried to understand um, systems in terms of industrial uh, relationships extrapolated that then to urban dynamics and finally to world dynamics and also him saying that people would never attempt to send a spaceship to the moon without first testing the equipment. So already he was arguing for a better understanding of our presence uh, on this planet, trying to model this with kind of um, um, cause and effect uh, relationships in increasingly complex ways. Students of his were then for the Club of Rome developing this idea of the limits to growth, so understanding the totality uh, of the planet we are on as a system which could be understood in terms of its relationships in the form of cause and effect relationships so that we could model um, the um, resource extraction and its relationships with limits, uh, specifically also limits um, for our population. Um, of course, they were a bit early uh, with these ideas and they underestimated human ingenuity 
So what happened in the meantime is actually that we were so much more capable to extract resources from this planet with better drilling for oil, with fracking and so on, that we could actually extend the limits um, they were predicting um, beyond um, the time they were predicting the bottleneck at. So this is the first, the first idea, a kind of, um, a kind of let's say, uh, engineering-based way, based on cause and effect, to try to understand the system we are living in. Another really important way of looking at it is in terms of complex system science, an exponent of which you see here, Geoffrey West from the Santa Fe Institute. He took concepts developed by Professor Wieser, a zoologist, which looked at scaling um, um, relationships uh, in the animal kingdom or the, in, in, in biology, where he has shown that um, there are certain specific ways in which um, nature is organized, which is that the bigger an organism is, the more efficient it is serving its individual cells. So an elephant is a much bigger, but also a much more efficient animal to some degree than, for example, a mouse. The same is true for cities. So also in cities, you have a similar type of, of scaling, uh, even to a larger degree than uh, in the animal kingdom. So what you see here is data which Geoffrey West assembled where he shows that if you take a city, then of course you have um, the housing requirement, so here in the middle, which scales perfectly with the size of the city. So the more people you have, the more housing you need. Right? Of course, it scales with a factor of one. But he also shows that uh, at the very bottom, that cities become increasingly efficient at delivering services, the bigger they are. So you need less electrical cables. You need less road surface at the bottom, uh, shown at the bottom, when a city grows. So cities become more efficient at delivering services. And at the top, you also see that cities become more effective in generating value. So the bigger a city is, the more patent it generates, the more GDP it produces per capita always than uh, smaller cities. So this basically is the fuel which makes cities grow. Because cities are more effective at delivering services and more efficient in terms of generating wealth and value, that's the reason why cities are inherently growing and are inherently um, reaching out into the hinterland to grab more resources and are inherently becoming more powerful. And of course, as soon as a city has a kind of new trick to grow, a new trick to become more connected, like, for example, due to industry, then it can even better reach out into the hinterland and become more effective in accumulate wealth and value. Like, you know, so cities are a bit like a nuclear reactor. If you don't slow them down, they inherently grow and become bigger because they are more effective to provide services and more efficient to generate value, the bigger they are. Of course, cities then are in, in competition, that's why they can then not grow quite as easily because one city stops the other, but nevertheless, the urban system inherently uh, is growing. And there are different types of growth, right? Specifically, um, what we see is when cities grow um, kind of without boundaries, they grow in a super exponential way, 
And I will explain you in a second what that means. And in super exponential ways, uh, you always generate a kind of a, a, a limit to growth, um, which could be potentially catastrophic, as we have seen uh, in the case of Jared Diamond with his book Collapse. But through human ingenuity, we are then able to have a new invention, which allows us again uh, to reach better uh, for resources or to work more efficiently and effectively and uh, therefore um, continue growing. And what we have seen over the last millennia is again and again and again that we avoided collapse by being clever and intelligent with new innovations. And I can give you an example of super exponential growth with this um, image here, which you might know. It's the so-called Euler's coin or Euler's disk. It's basically um, a disk which is rotating. And of course, in space, this disk would rotate forever. Right? Without gravity, this disk would rotate forever, but there is gravity. And a little tumble of the disk makes the disk not upright anymore, but to start to fall down. But the fall down, of course, uh, doesn't happen immediately because the disk is rotating. Uh, but you see that the more it rotates, the closer it comes to the ground because it loses energy through friction and through air resistance. And the closer it gets to the ground, the faster it spins because the factors working on this disk are forcing it into a super exponential increase in speed of rotation, which you hear as this noise in this video and it, it increases more and more and more, faster and faster. Until it stops. And that's the effect of super exponential growth. Oops, hello. Let me try now to go on. And a person who studied this type of growth is a Didier Zonet. And the, ar the argument here, by basically, which is important, is that um, you know, because cities are more effective at providing services and more efficient at generating wealth, all of these factors conspire together to make cities grow super exponentially. They grow faster than exponential. And a person <clears throat> studying this type of super exponential growth is Didier Zonet, who was looking at financial bubbles and how they crash. And super exponential growth means that you do not asymptotically um, uh, reach uh, infinity, infinity like in exponential growth, but you reach infinity in finite time, right? And reaching an infinity in finite time means something changes. And if you're looking at a physical system like ecology or even something like a financial bubble, then something happens. A bubble bursts, for example, right? like for example, a financial collapse. And what now Didier Zonet did, he looked at the very, very first image I have shown you, the population growth, remember this red um, increase of population I showed you? He described this as a super exponential formula and he looked when this mathematical equation would turn vertical in our graph, would therefore generate 
what he calls a singularity, and would therefore generate some form of change, some form of regime change. And in looking at the world population and the world GDP since the birth of Christ, he predicts that around 2050, plus minus 20 years, something will change. He also sees that in economic data, for example, when you look at the Dow Jones or the S&P um, um, uh, indices, and also sees that something changes in 2050. And what's behind that is this type of effect, what you can also describe as a bifurcation. So for you, to, for you, it is important to understand that a system can respond to stress in different ways. So what you have here, and, and as, an, as an example he uh, uses, uh, is this um, frog which is sitting in the water and you slowly increase the heat. Now, on the top left, you have a diagram which shows the conditions on the x-axis, the ecosystem state on the y-axis. And when you warm up this water a bit, the frog gets increasingly unhappy. But when you cool the water down again, nothing much happened. The frog is still alive. If, however, you increase the temperature more, then uh, it gets a bit more difficult for the frog and uh, it will need uh, more time to recover. And then on the very right hand side, you see that something fundamental has happened. We put so much stress um, onto this ecosystem state that something breaks. In our example, the frog dies, right? So the super exponential formula generated stresses in a, in a way that the system fell to a completely different state. The same thing has been predicted by Vanatsky in um, this um, analysis of how we affect the surface of the planet. So what he calls global forcing. So on the x-axis you have global forcing from low to high. On the y-axis we have the global ecological state, uh, you know, which is good at some point. Then we have more and more people affecting the planet. And again, <clears throat> he argues that in 2045, or again around 2050, with nine billion people, we will affect the planet in a way that something fundamental changes. And the point is now, once you fall down <clears throat> in this global ecological state to a new state, the low state, you cannot easily go back to the former um, um, well-organized state with a lot of value and a good ecological state because the curve has been broken, right? You have to take more time or you have to invent something new in order to go back to the starting state. This sounds a bit depressing uh, because it shows that some changes uh, which we're experiencing cannot be turned back easily. You know, so you cannot turn the frog from being dead to a live frog again simply by cooling the water down. Um, however, these types of effects are actually nothing so unusual and when you look into systems ecology, you see that these types of rapid changes of bifurcations and falling into different system states actually happens in nature again and again. And the person who can help us with that uh, is C.S. Holling, a systems ecologist who started writing in the 1970s about um, these types of phenomena and uh, wrote specifically a series of books which he also applied not only to natural systems but also to human systems. Uh, specifically interesting is his book called Panarchy. And he describes Panarchy as a framework of nature's rules. Panarchy, of course, in his um, use of the term 
an antithesis to the word hierarchy. So instead of a top-down relationship, you have a relationship where everything is related to everything. It also refers to Pan, the Greek god of nature. And his argument is that when you look at nature, you might think that nature is just stable in a, in a very like a ball on a flat surface and the ball might roll around but there are no forces acting on this ball and a very um, well-believed idea of course also in economy is that nature is balanced you know we, we tend to believe that that uh, if something is out of balance then um, it goes back to balance. So for example, if we take this ball in the B on the right, we move it up uh, this um, um, depression, then the ball will automatically roll back. Or you all know uh, the argument that markets will correct themselves. So if the markets are out of balance, so for example, global financial markets, if they're out of balance, then they will correct themselves, demand and the supply will uh, solve themselves and um, a stable market will be achieved again. And that is true for some times, but not always. There are also moments when what we have seen before happens, where a system changes much more fundamentally, where a bifurcation happens, for example, based on this singularity which we have seen before, and all of a sudden the system falls into a completely new state. And he also argues that uh, nature, however, can deal with that because nature is resilient. It can go back and forth between different types of states, be between states which are stable, then something fundamental happens, a forest fire, for example, and, but because nature is resilient, it can deal with that and move back again to a stable state, even so a momentarily catastrophic event has happened. And finally, all of this also evolves in time. So resiliences are again not stable in themselves, but also evolve. So C.S. Holling would argue that yes, there are things like singularities and bifurcations. They happen all the time. And in a natural context, that's a fact of life. And you might have an extinction event, like for example, when the dinosaurs got extinct, but nature will evolve into something new. And new species will start to dominate the planet. Now, the problem we have, of course, as a human species, is that we tended to believe that our cities are balanced and sustainable. We now understand that shock events can happen, that we need to look, look for resilience. And the argument we need to be, we need to do that in a way where we evolve to more and more clever ways of uh, understanding and running our cities. This diagram happens to be extremely helpful and it's important for you to understand a bit what it means. It basically shows you what is behind these changes and adaptations which C.S. Holling is describing. And in some ways you will recognize that the growth patterns which we have seen at the very first slide of the lecture and also in the bubbles uh, earlier, are actually embedded in this. So what you see here is a diagram where on the x-axis you have connectedness. Remember the relations and connectedness which we have seen in our urban axioms. But it, the same type of connectedness you also have in natural systems. You have it in companies, when a company is hiring more and more people and increasing its markets. On the left hand side, the y-axis, you have potential, so value generated, a city growing more 
complex and bigger, a market growing, a company growing, or a civilization growing, or for example a rainforest growing, and more or more biomass being accumulated in the trees uh, of this rainforest. And over time you have, uh, from below left to top right, step by step by step, this system growing more and more connected and at the same time having more and more value. <clears throat> and for a very long time this might be a very stable and balanced situation. And in fact, if you have local disturbances, the system will correct itself and go back to a balanced state. A market functioning, a city blossoming, a civilization thriving, or a rainforest functioning. But at some point, you might have a tipping point which changes the context of this system in a way this system can all of a sudden not absorb anymore. For example, climate change might rise, raise sea levels and a lot of coastal cities might have problems. Or our Minoan culture in Crete might not have trees anymore and ecological degradation might make it more and more complicated to keep the agricultural society of the Minoans functioning. And then something happens, like for example a volcano explodes, a big wave comes, an earthquake comes, and all of a sudden this stable um, system goes through a change, decays, all of these opportunities the system had, uh, the potential it has, is released into the environment. For example, when a company goes bankrupt, all the industrial halls are all of a sudden empty. When an empire collapses, like in China or in Egypt, uh, all of a sudden um, um, other people might uh, come in. Um, you still have connectedness, but the connectedness rapidly falls apart, but is then reorganized in the top left in simple ways, in a kind of a bricolage type of way. So you have a warring state interlude between the Egyptian kingdoms. You have the nomads invading the Chinese empire. You have uh, temporary uses in our um, industrial companies, empty halls, <clears throat> or you have plants which are reorganizing um, a decaying forest uh, after a bushfire. So you have potential but not so much connectedness. And then again this system might then dissolve towards the left and lose uh, nutrients or it might then slowly reorganize itself that, that again a kind of a dominant culture can develop uh, and so on and so on and then this figure eight kind of oscillates in time and C.S. Holling's argument is that the, these types of effects happen both spatially and time-wise in a nested manner. You have some of these um, blossoming and decay, reorganization, blossoming and decay, reorganization. You have that happen in a matter <clears throat> of minutes in the bacteria world, for example, in a space which is tiny, but at the same time uh, with things like the Ice Age um, or big um, changes in the world's biosphere uh, over the Earth's ages, you might have that in tens of thousands of years and also over, over very large scales, of course the biggest scale being the planet itself. Right? So this is something completely normal that happens and 
has to do with the fact that we're living in an instable environment on this speck of dust orbiting the planet. Resilience, by the way, is then something which happens in the third dimension of our diagram and has to do with the ability to deal elastically with external impacts on the system. When you can deal elastically with it, for example, we have a, a COVID pandemic and yet you're able to give everybody a small loan, a temporary job or unemployment insurance and you keep the connectedness intact, then that is resilience. If, however, like in the United States, because of the pandemic, everybody immediately loses jobs. Because you lose a job, you lose your health insurance. Because you lose job and health insurance, you lose your house and so on. Then that is called, then that is the absence of resilience or what he calls brittleness, right? It is the inability of a system to elastically respond to external influences. So what is very important is that there is a kind of a resilience argument which has to do with an engineering way of thinking about resilience, which has to do with robustness. You know, so we are not only sustainable, we are robust uh, because we are able to deal with adversity. Um, which is how resilience is mostly discussed right now in public. But C.S. Hollings' argument for resilience is actually a bit different. It is the ability of a system um, to really change into another mode of behavior in order to keep its connectedness intact. A very, very good example is our biosphere during winter. You know, you have an abundant summer meadow uh, which has a huge amount of connectedness and value. But during winter, this meadow is able to keep its connectedness with seeds buried in the ground and with a lot of um, 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 uh, measures in order to survive the cold. So the connectedness is, is intact. The property of the system quantitatively is much, much, much smaller. So there is, there is no biomass, almost no biomass. And yet in the next spring, because connectedness was kept, uh, the meadow is able to bloom again. Right? For us, this would mean uh, a resilience in, on this type of societal sense would mean that we are not only able to defend our GDP and our economic growth in terms of resilience, number one, the engineering resilience by technological means, but more specifically, we are able to keep uh, our society intact by reducing our GDP in a kind of a hibernation mode to maybe 10% of what it normally would be, we hibernate, keep our relationships, social, industrial, economic relationships intact, and when life is better again, we take this connectedness and we fold it out again to the former complexity and value. That would be a true resilience. And um, this is a type of thing thing we should think about um, when we think about the long term in a real way uh, about our cities. And one important argument he is making that um, probably the path to sustainability is to think in terms of systems of subsidiarity where we have um, parts of a system which are in parts autonomous, which kind of function like units of neighborhoods and so on, which solve a lot of problems on that scale. And are, these are then nested together 
into the next bigger scale and they again are nested to kind of next bigger scale and we need to govern um, our world acting on all of these individual scales together um, and individually in order to become more autonomous. And this type of thinking I want to discuss with you with this concept uh, of deep urbanism and my argument is that deep urbanism should be the discipline of the relationships, so the connections and connectedness that generate a complex system of people and their material, technological and symbolic culture acting on a territory with its specific emergent dynamics and their externalities. Again, this sounds a bit complicated, but what I mean by this is that we need to be able to think about our cities in terms of depth. And by depth, I mean the temporal depth I try to show you with this very quick exercise of turning back the clock, going to the origin of cities and then going forward again, looking at this urban relay which we have seen. So the lecture two will be about depth in time. Then, so to speak, perpendicularly to time we have relational depth, so depth in space or depth in networks, also depth in terms of digital networks, which has to do with connectedness at a given moment in time. So that's relational depth, which will be lecture three. Then lecture four, which will be about cognitive, de cognitive depth. So how we as embodied brains are generating cities, are building cities, and how then in turn cities are acting back on us, defining our behavior and our lives, our collective lives very, uh, very specifically. This is lecture four. And lecture five, six, and seven is about practice, about deep moves, like in chess, so that we anticipate issues also in the future, about deep tech, which has very much to do also with these issues of um, nestedness, which we have been seeing, and then lecture seven, which will be about deep resonance, which has to do with beauty and storytelling, which in the end uh, is what we need to do in order not to not only understand complexity, but also narrate it in a way which becomes understandable uh, for a wider audience. And with this, I'm finally through. Thanks for your patience. Uh, Katya is used to these endless lectures and I'm always too long. I promised myself I would do it within an hour. It again took a bit longer, but I hope it was still enjoyable. Thanks for your patience. Was it clear enough? Yeah, I saw it clear enough. Thank you. And are you now all shocked and despaired, or you you see hope? I see hope. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> it was very interesting. Thank you, but uh, quite hard to comment on because a lot of things that have been mentioned. Yeah. I mean, the next lectures will be a bit easier because they are more tangible. So I think in this lecture, I kind of needed to, as Katya very nicely put it, uh, prepare the ground, uh, you know, basically instilling in you the idea and almost visceral understanding that the world is dynamic in a very true sense, right? And the dynamic has an inherent behavior and we are able to understand this behavior if we look well enough 
And if we look uh, in a way being unafraid of what we see, right? Because a lot of the discussion right now of sustainability, resilience and, and so on is, is very much about political correctness. You know, so we believe, um, you know, so originally it was everything was about growth and progress. Then we realized that there might be limits. Then sustainability was an attempt of discussing these limits while at the same time keeping the narrative of progress and growth intact. So if we behave well, we can still grow, right? Then we realized that this also might be difficult. Then the idea of resilience came in. Uh, we can still grow, but we need to not only be sustainable, but also uh, very robust. We need to defend ourselves against adversity. Um, but we are unable to question the underlying logic uh, or the underlying narrative that um, progress and growth will be kept intact, you know, which has to do with our economy, and it has to do with our social security systems, it has to do with technological change and so on. And I believe we need to be able to have narratives which deal with true transformation um, which, however, are still positive. And uh, in this way, for me, science fiction uh, is very important because science fiction is kind of peeking be behind the event horizon of true transformation. And the great ability of somebody like Kim Stanley Robinson is to think about fundamental transformation, for example, sea level rise to a degree that Man Lower Manhattan becomes a kind of a Venice of the future. And despite this fundamental change, even catastrophic change, you could argue, to still write about people having exciting, interesting, full, rich and responsible lives. Right? I think this type of ability we need to generate. So an understanding of the system we are in and an ability to have narratives which are positive despite what we will know about ourselves when we look more closely. Could you probably imagine that people, for example, in Mesopotamia, they're discussing their future collapse and their concept of resilience or not? Or is it the first time in history or not? No, I think, uh, <laughs> uh, no, I think what I have shown you is that collapse is a fact of life. You know, I think there are, there are kind of uh, very simple ancient wisdoms. Everything that has a beginning has an end. Yeah, of course, right? Everything which grows needs to decay, of course. Um, and that has been true for all of evolutionary history, where I think it's now a very popular knowledge that there were extinction events which were as um, important for the development of our current biosphere as the steady evolution in a growing environment, right? So th there were extinction events in the um, um, evolutionary past. And what I have shown you with um, Jared Diamond, there were collapses uh, in our urban historic um, timeline, right? So, so yes, of course there were collapses and there are collapses around us every day. The difficulty we are facing right now that we leave, that we live at a kind of a peak of connectedness right now, which we um, in, a, in everyday life call globalization, right? Globalization is a peak of connectedness. And therefore, um, uh, 
you know, and peak of connectedness also means a peak of potential instability. Um, so uh, it, it will be a, be a it will be a bumpy ride, right? And part of this bumpy ride we are currently in the COVID pandemic is nothing else than peak of connectedness translating via this tiny speck of RNA traveling through the air into global effectiveness. Because we are all connected, this virus travels so easily, right? So, so this is a direct consequence of a globally connected culture and um, was almost inevitable in coming. On the other hand, um, you know, reacting on this moment elegantly uh, in some parts of the world maybe leads to the fact that all of a sudden the lagoon of Venice is clearing up, the canals becoming crystal clear, there are dolphins at the coast of Sicily, the skies above China um, are unpolluted all of a sudden, and people are enjoying their gardens. You know, so so again, this is this is resilience, right? If if we are able as a society to achieve this, that these are simply moments of slowing down, but these are pleasurable pleasurable moments of slowing down. That's true resilience. The danger, of course, is if these moments of collapse produce real disruption. Again, disruption of jobs, disruption of social security, disruption of, wealth, of healthcare. That is extremely dangerous because then all of a sudden we generate downward spirals. So what we need to achieve is a system of nested stabilities where if you fall out of a larger scale connectedness, you fall back into a lower scale of connectedness, for example, you and your family in a nice garden. I think that's the dream, right? To achieve this in our highly populated, hyper-connected um, world is not so easy, of course. But I think that's why you are here. You know, I think what you need is a clear understanding of where we are at. And you need a narrative for the future. So the understanding of where you're at, that's what I call deep urbanism. And the narrative of the future has to do with these nested systems, has to do with subsidiarity, has to do with the ability to deal with varying amounts of connectedness in an elegant way to be able to be local in a positive manner and in one of the last lectures i will tell you about a book, a book which we are currently currently publishing called the industrious city and this book is very much an attempt of rethinking industrialization in a de sorry, in a re-localizing or de-globalizing world, for example, right? Cool. Any more questions? I think this has been two hours, so uh, thanks for your patience. And again, the next lectures will be a bit more tangible. And feel free to ask all the questions you have now at these moments also. Well, thank you so much, Marcus. And I think it's um, this lecture, like in uh, probably what we experience after this lecture, it's uh, exactly uh, that we understand that cities are very complex 
And sometimes um, it kind of um, may be interesting point that I understood right now that oh, when we are doing something, sometimes we don't understand about these uh, circles, right? And uh, about something. So we every time try to, uh, I don't know, like increase, increase productivity, increase everything. And uh, during that moment, like none of us think about that we are approaching to disruption. So we do our ourselves, we make this disruption happens, basically, sometimes. So that's an interesting point. And um, I think we will come back to this lecture during other lectures. So we, we will reflect maybe more on some aspects of that. So that's interesting. Thank you so much for being with us. And sure. thank you so much for your time and expertise. Super. Uh, well, enjoy the day and uh, see you in a week. Thank you. Yep. Ciao. Ciao. Thanks so much.